So it gives me a lot of pleasure to introduce the second keynote speaker for the conference, Dr. Kate Mitchie. Uh, Kate, um, I could read out her bio. She provided me with an exceedingly long bio, so thank you. Um, but uh, Kate is a senior lecturer at the University of New South Wales with over two decades of experience and expertise in protein structural biology. And she's done a lot of other things, and you can go on our website to read that. So what I thought I would do, because it came up yesterday when Kate gave a fantastic training session, is reflect on how Galaxy Australia connects with people that are really good for Galaxy Australia, and we hope we're really good for them. Uh, so Kate and I looked at each other blankly and went, how did we meet again? It was during COVID, which uh, obviously makes it electronic. So I did the obvious thing. I searched through my emails and when AlphaFold came out, it was an obvious game changer and there was a push from our directors to get it onto Galaxy as soon as possible. And the Galaxy Australia team worked with Galaxy Europe, we worked with Azure and we got the tool on. And one of the things we had been learning at the time was the importance of user experience and user uh, interface. So we arranged to interview some of our early adopters of AlphaFold. And uh, thanks to Steve Manos, wherever he is in the room here, back there, hi Stephen. Uh, Stephen linked us into some people at the University of New South Wales who linked us through to Kate, who got on and used AlphaFold. And then we had the pleasure of interviewing Kate, myself and, and Maddie, uh, which was at one of our UI UX people for about an hour and were absolutely blown away with the level of knowledge of the field and of a field that we were blissfully unaware of at the time for the impact that AlphaFold was having on a community and a community that we were fostering through Galaxy. So um, I am very confident that Kate is going to reflect some of that passion uh, for what we've managed to do together today. Uh, the talk and session is an hour. There will be time for question and answer. There will be the bell uh, that we're all loving so much to go off to remind us for the talk and questions. So, with that, thank you, Kate, for coming up um, and look forward to your talk. So make sure I'm on. Can everyone, yes, everyone can hear me. Um, so thank you, Gareth, thank you for the invitation. It's um, a bit daunting as a structural biologist to come to a meeting where um, I predominantly don't speak the language that most of you guys do. So I'm, I don't speak code, I never learned any code and I found myself in this really rude position accidentally and so uh, forgive me if I make some some gaffes of the kind of conversation and I get the acronyms wrong because there's plenty of them. Um, so I trained uh, as a structural biologist, uh, which means that my job is to solve the atomic structures of proteins. And that means that you have to able to clone. So you have to be able to do some bioinformatics. You have to be able to PCR. You have to be able to overexpress it in bacteria. You have to purify them. Then you normally put it into crystal trays and hope to goodness it would crystallize and then you'd stick it on an x-ray set or the synchrotron and then you'd have to collect that data and then you'd have to solve that and that could take many many years and then of course there was a recent revolution so the 2010 nobel prize for cryo-electron microscopy came and the whole field of structural biology switched from crystallography mostly overnight to cryo-electron microscopy and then it came with a whole new ball of caveats and then during lockdown in 2021 AlphaFold was released and that's another game changer and um, so I find myself speaking to a group of people that probably aren't aware of what's happened in structural biology because half the structural biologists aren't aware yet of what's happened in structural biology. So today I'm going to move quite quickly because there's a lot of material to get through um, and I realise that none of you speak protein, I'm assuming none of you speak protein so please don't be offended if you do. I need to give you a little bit of background about what protein is and what the problem is that we're trying to solve so that you can follow the magnitude of the advances. And the last half of the lecture, I want to go through the deep learning changes that have happened uh, and they're happening every day. And this is something that I would really appeal to you guys is the structural biology uh, sort of discipline doesn't understand the difficulty of the compute problem that's coming for them. And I think I'd really like you guys to pay attention to the scale of the problem so that you're ready when they need you. Yeah. All right. So uh, I'm just got to work out how to go next. 
All right, so firstly, what is AlphaFold? How does it work? How do you use it? So I'll tell you why it's exciting. And then how has it progressed? So the central dogma of structural biology or of molecular biology, and this is a very basic overview, so there are certainly some more intricate pathways, but the general idea is that you have your DNA and that's a template pattern for the little protein machines that carry out the jobs in your cells. So you have this like master plan, and when you need that protein to do a particular job, it gets copied into RNA and it gets taken to the protein factory called the ribosome, and then it's translated into a string of amino acids uh, like a beads on a string that fold up into a protein and the protein is the final uh, machine that does the job. And so you've got a pattern, a temporary pattern and the final machine. So before we go much further to talk about the final machines, the proteins, I need to just show you and make you kind of familiar with the different ways we present protein structures because we use them in different ways because they're complicated molecules. So it's really, really big chemistry. So the space filling diagram um, just shows little baubles on a string and they're really hard to understand. We don't use this um, uh, description very much. The stick diagram shows every single um, carbon atom, um, nitrogen, oxygen atom in the molecule, and that's the one uh, second to the left. You can see it's quite complicated. It's really hard to understand a protein when you look at it um, just like that. And we only use this uh, way of describing a protein when you're looking at very fine details of active sites of enzymes and functional components. The ribbon diagram is the most common one, which we will see, and that's the one that most people will look at when they look at AlphaFold results. It shows you the secondary structures of the proteins and it enables the structural biologist to see the general fold of the protein, which is kind of the core of how that protein is assembling. And it enables us to see sort of gross features very quickly. And then the last diagram is the surface diagram, which shows you effectively the surface of the molecule. And that's the thing that becomes important when you're designing drugs. You'll, you need to make a molecule that fits that surface intimately and it has to also not match just the shape, but also the charge behaviours or the um, electrostatic behaviours of the surface of the protein. So just to sort of sum up protein folding, I've got this little video. Um, it's really poor high resolution, so apologies for that, but it really sums up the problem quite well. So we've got a string of amino acids, so it's just the same chemistry along the backbone, and then these little functional groups, so there's 12 of them highlighted in white here, and they're all different. So there's 21 general amino acids, and they're all slightly different. To make it easy, and we're lazy, we give each amino acid a letter from the alphabet. So you can see we're already transferring to a language here. So then if we colour that same string from blue to red, that's important because you're going to see that when the protein folds up, that the front and the back of the protein could end up in any particular place. And so colouring it helps us understand how it folds. So because of the chemistry of the amino acids, they have a propensity to form secondary structures, which are the alpha helices and beta sheets. And so here the molecule is assembling into these little kind of curly sections. So this is just an alpha helical protein. And the folding process is how those sections fold up into the three-dimensional structure. Now, AlphaFold doesn't answer this folding problem, and I'll talk about that later. But what AlphaFold does is calculate the structure of the protein at the end based on the sequence you give it. Now, we're just going to switch on, put the um, alphabet back on so you can see each individual um, amino acid. And then we're going to turn on we're going to turn on the chemistry so you can see every single individual bond. So you can see why looking at it in this way is very complicated and it's not very helpful. But you can now see that the red and the, the blue, the front and the back of the protein, have now folded up to be in exactly the same place three-dimensionally. So this is a big problem. You don't know where a part of the protein is going to be until it's folded. And then here we've turned on the surface structure so you can see the arrangement of how that protein folds. So it's been a really big long-term problem understanding how a protein folds and what the final structure is. Um, so then just briefly, that's just saying it in schematic form. So we've got our strings of amino acids. We've got two major types of secondary structure, these beta sheets and these alpha helices. That's called secondary structure. How they arrange and fold up gives us our tertiary structure. And those proteins can associate sometimes with themselves or with other proteins to carry out much more complicated tasks. And so that's called quaternary structure or complex formation. So why in the hell do we do this? Why are they useful? Um, it helps us really understand how things work. So for instance, here is the picture of the spike protein, which is probably the molecule that you guys are most familiar with. Um, the one on the left is from SARS and the one on the right is from COVID. And you can see that they're very, very similar in the way they look. And that really helped us with the pandemic because we already understood a closely related relative to, to COVID. So we already had people working on vaccine production for SARS. So knowing this information really trims down the sorts of places we need to be looking for drug development and understand function. So this is the um, first structure of the um, main protease. So viruses make their proteins in a really long thing string and they're fairly unusual in this way. And then there's normally a protease which then cuts the string into little pieces. So there's little folded units that then go off and do their job. And so if you can stop the protease that breaks the protein um, into individual parts, then you can break 
the virus from working. So the proteases are normally the targets of um, drug development. And this is the structure of the first um, development of um, COVID um, drugs. And you can see the structure on the uh, right. Um, there's an overlay of the SARS and of COVID. And you can see that at uh, the bottom panel that there's very little difference between the two of them. So that's really showing us sort of the active side of the enzyme and how it functions. So if we know all of this, we can make much better drugs and we can also understand how, how it works. Previously, we used to do this by X-ray crystallography, and you'd have to make the protein, crystallize the protein, take it to a synchrotron source or an X-ray machine, get a diffraction pattern, solve it by Fourier transform, build into the model, and the process costs probably in the order of about $100,000 um, on average per protein. It's very slow. I spent years solving one and never got there. The ribosome took 30 years and numerous postdocs who completely failed and got a Nobel Prize, three different research groups. It's a big problem. It's hard science. Recently, we moved to cryo-EM. Cryo-EM hasn't made it any bigger. It's just made the data sets bigger. So that's a different computing problem again, and it's significant. The data sets are sort of terabytes in size, and that's currently the sort of headache that the unis have. Um, it's a brute force method. You purify your proteins. You image them by um, a microscope. You collect millions of the particles. You basically do 2D averaging of the individual particles, and then you can do 3D averaging to, to build an atomic structure. So it's, it's really cutting edge, but it's really, really brute force on the compute. So because of this being so expensive and so difficult, computing has always been kind of the holy grail. Could we compute the structure? You've got the sequence, you should be able to compute it. And so there's a whole field of structural biologists just working on the computational problem. Can we do this calcul like by calculation? And so for 20 years, 40 years, 30 years, um, we've run a critical assessment of protein structure competition where we've hidden a bunch of in, um, experimental sequences which no one's ever seen and then we release the um, amino acid sequence and the coders would take the uh, sequences and then try to predict the structures and then independent structural assessors would come back and compare the calculated models to the real models and kind of rank everyone's um, estimates and what happened in 2014 was something really really quite um, shocking um, and that's this. So you can't see it because it's hidden by the axis of the graph. And that's the performance of AlphaFold 2 versus every other competitor at that competition. So this was an absolute lightning bolt moment for us that we basically can now calculate structures to within experimental confidence. And that's really, really quite shocking. And you can see the nature reviews um, in the bottom corner. It will change everything. And that really is an understatement. And I think half the structural biologists in the world still haven't cottoned on as to how serious this is. It's a really big change and it's really exciting. So we had to wait another seven, eight months before um, DeepMind, who developed AlphaFold, um, published the paper. They promised they would tell us how they did it and we had to wait a very long time. Um, they put the code nicely on GitHub and they gave us a beautiful paper, um, which I can almost read. And then they gave us 62 pages of supplementary data, which I have tried to read and haven't done a very good job of. But I encourage you, if you want to understand the architecture behind these sorts of programs, then that's a really good place to start. So how does it work? It's a bit of a game changer. So it's really mining evolutionary data in a really kind of, I think, quite a cool way. So the first thing it does is you put your protein sequence in and it does a multiple sequence alignment. So it's really doing a lot of bioinformatics. And then, so it makes a really, really large um, multiple sequence alignment. Google says you need to have 30 friends in your multiple sequence alignment before you can get a reliable structure, at least 30. When I download the results, they're often 10 gigabytes in size. So we're not talking like a little multiple sequence alignment, we're talking a big multiple sequence alignment. The second thing it does is it makes a pairwise array of each protein amino acid versus the other amino acids in the chain. So, you know, residue A versus residue B versus residue C for every single residue. And it feeds that into two transformers. So the first one is called an evoformer. And um, it basically is looking for co-evolution of amino acids across evolution. So it looks at each one. And if one changes and sees that another residue also changes across evolution, it concludes that those proteins must be linked together. Those amino acids must be linked together in three-dimensional space. So you can imagine if you've got a folding protein, it's folded up. You've got two amino acids that are next to each other. If this one gets big, to accommodate the same structure, this one has to get smaller. And so it's using this co-evolution approach to map the distances theoretically through evolution to feed into um, the next structure model later on. And so that's what it does. It, it has lots and lots of attention. So if you don't know anything about attention, there's a cool paper we'll talk about in a minute about attention. So it's looking at those pairwise evolution and um, maps it into that pairwise array and it feeds it back in a circular fashion. So it's moving, uh, it's reading the data, 
it feeds it into the array, it then looks at the data again and says, is anything close by also contacting? So it's continually updating. And then the next step after that is the second transformer, which is the structure module. And the structure module takes the distances that come from the first transformer and does um, a bunch of cool things. So it does a sort of geometrical arrangement in three-dimensional space. It doesn't link the amino acids together. It puts them into a, a gaseous box of unbonded amino acids. And it tries to make all the amino acids link together to obey the rules of the pairwise evolution data that came from the first transformer. And it builds a structure de novo from that. And it feeds that back into the first one to look for more pairwise interactions and to hone those. And so it's the weights of the, from the attention from training, which is telling AlphaFold how to fold a protein, that we don't really quite understand exactly the details of what it's done. And that's why I guess it's the deep learning part's kind of exciting about it. And then um, the most important thing, I guess, is to the field of deep learning is this particular paper called Attention is All You Need. And I guess is this is one of the most pivotal papers for deep learning. And so if you're really into uh, code, this is something you should read. And it explains what attention is and why it's made really speaking, protein or language models so important. So this really is a critical paper for machine learning. And I have a handout which I've given to Gareth, which we can share that has all the references, so you don't need to write them all down in a hurry. Um, okay, so how do you run it? It's a really big piece of code, and it's something that freaked me out when I first read the paper. It was like, we immediately need to have this, and then I read what was required and went, holy hell, I can't do this. Uh, so you need a big machine. Um, you need GPU. It's not negotiable, you need GPU. And it needs three terabytes of disk space because it uses the entire um, big fantastic database to do your multiple sequence alignments. And it's super intensive read in, read out. So it's always referring to that database in and out and in and out and in and out. So you need that really on SSD and you want it close to your GPU. So that's quite a challenge. So it's not the sort of thing you can run on your laptop. Where can you run it now? So Galaxy, as um, Gareth said, um, runs it here. I've been told you can run it on um, Galaxy US and Galaxy Europe. You can run a free version that Gal uh, Google has released on the Colab Notebooks. If you Google Colab Notebooks AlphaFold, you'll come to the site. However, it's CPU and GPU and time limited. So we find that for large protein structures that it tends to um, time out. You can install it locally, um, and that's how I started off doing it. I got a grant um, to install it um, as a Docker install. It's also pushed by a lot of um, computing um, consortia. So there's a consortia called SB Grid. Um, they push a lot of structural biology um, software to make it easier for system admins to handle, um, and they fortunately push it. Um, you can install it in the cloud. It works quite well in the cloud because the data that you're uploading is quite small and the data you download is quite small. It's actually the compute that's the problem here, not the size of the data set. Um, and you can, I'm recently moving across to Google, Google Vertex, and the advantage for that is that we can strap on modules onto the side, so up and down, and there's lots of feed-in programs that are coming from deep learning that use similar sorts of compute. But, um, you know, uh, feed data in and need to take data out. So you want an expandable system, ideally. So here we go. So this is the day, the week after the code was released, the day of the paper, I emailed the head of scientific computing saying, I'm wondering if we could run this code here at UNSW. And he very kindly, we were all in lockdown, we had nothing to do. And he said, look, we can give you a, a small grant and some cash to like burn in, in AWS and I'll give you a cloud engineer that knows how to install because you don't know what you're talking about. And I was like, thank you very much, sir. And we set up our first instance of AlphaFold in AWS, which was super exciting. And then a day later, Google then published another paper saying that the human proteome had then been freely released and sold. And I thought, oh no, maybe I've misused the university's resources. Oh, you know, this is really embarrassing. Maybe I'm like wasting it. But the first release only came with the human proteome. And so if you weren't working on humans, then you were really without luck. And um, so you can now download the structure of any human protein sold by AlphaFold from EBI. So the limitations of the EBI, data, EBI database. Now it's changed quite a lot. Um, they've updated it many times since, and there's now millions and millions of structures. So they've basically put the whole of Uniprot on, on EBI. However, it doesn't run residues that are very, very short, or um, proteins that are very short, and for very, very long proteins, it's too much to calculate. So anything over two, two and a half thousand is not there. It's only for the human proteome, um, for, the, for the human protein own, only, they've broken the really big ones down into smaller subunits and run those independently because they figure that they're still a major target for research groups. So that one's there, but if you're in another organism, you won't see them. There are proteins that contain a few non-natural amino acids, which we denote with the residue uh, X. And if that's in your sequence, it will not run and it will not be in the EBI database. So that's mindful if you're running your own, you need to replace that with something like an alanine so that then you can just run the code to get what you expect the protein to be. 
Um, and then there's a few things about the uni prod. If it's not in their one sequence definition, then it won't be there. And if it's been modified, it won't be there. But most importantly, for a lot of my colleagues who work on viruses, if it's a viral protein, it's not there. And that's a problem because um, there's a lot of viral research that's obviously quite relevant. And I'm sure you understand the reasons for that. I don't need to elaborate. So this is some insight into how this affects my, my, my discipline. So I went to my friend who's a structural biologist and said, hey, do you have any cool examples of structures that you've never submitted to the PDB that you've never published? Because I want to test the AlphaFold machine and see if it's any good. Because at this stage, the community didn't know how good AlphaFold was because we'd never been able to test it. And most of us have seen lots of modeling programs before and they're all pretty rubbish. So we weren't very excited about it. We thought, oh, it can't be that good. So my colleague provided me with a small protein that had never been submitted and I ran it on the AlphaFold database. And then I sent it to him and I asked him, how did it go? And this is the response I got. Now, mind you, he's a professor in physics and he generally doesn't overstate things. So for him to come back with his statement is, my mind is blown, I think is a really clear indication that we're onto something quite significant here. And he goes on to some boring technical details, but the very last line is, I find this amazing, is exactly what's happened to the field. Like this is really amazing. And these are the results of the um, experiment we ran. So the first one on the left is showing alpha fold, full alpha fold from our home instance and the CoLab alpha fold. So this was the truncated database that was running for free on Google. And you can see that the two structures don't overlay and there's quite a lot of difference in the structures. So one of the purple ones got these alpha helices and you'll see that the orange one doesn't. So that's a, for a structural biologist, it's a fundamental difference. It's a big problem. It's telling you that the two folds are completely different. It's not right. And then you can see the one on the right that the experimental structure is in pink and the alpha fold structure is in orange. And you can see that the backbone is overlaid really, really well. In fact, it's spectacularly good. And so we had never seen a program that could calculate a structure to this accuracy ever before. And it showed me quite quickly that even using truncated code where they trimmed down the database, they didn't use all the bells and whistles, was also not giving us the level of compute that we needed to get the structures. So that was a good warning very, very early on. And it told me immediately that we were onto something that was important. So how good is it? Well, AlphaFold can predict some structures amazingly well. Or maybe you're predicting all of them well and just maybe not all of them are structured. But we see um, really, really good high prediction, high confidence structures that turn out experimentally to be the same. We do see a bunch of ones that really don't look great. And there are definitely cases where it's got it wrong. We have solved the structure and we know that the data is not correct. And there's a whole bunch of things that turn out to look unstructured. And it's kind of caused quite a lot of questions in the field as to how important is um, the structure, has it got it right? Uh, so it's pretty good for most things. So if you have a look at the whole proteome of organisms, if you look at the table on the right, you can see that in, in the blues are the experimental data, and you can see in the orange and the lighter orange is how much alpha folds contributed. And you can see that for the majority of every single organism, the alpha fold is contributing more structural data to the community than we've ever seen before on looking at the whole history of human endeavor on solving structures of, of, of proteomes. So it's massive. So here's an example. The first experimental example um, we did of an in-house case at the university after the first month we had the, had the uh, alpha fold machine running. So this is before we had the caveats of blue meaning good and red meaning bad for alpha fold. So at the moment it's just listing the color of the structure confidence by um, inverse, um, so it's B factor. So it's showing red is good in this case. So it folded this particularly important retrovirus protein that's endemic in the Australian indigenous population here, causes cancer, it's really horrible, and we've never been able to crystallize or solve the structure. Straight away, we had a structure for this particular protein. It told us that the protein folded into two domains and there was probably a flexible bit in the middle. And so my colleague cut the protein to that location, made both components and immediately crystallized it. And it had been in the literature that this protein was impossible to crystallize prior to this. So we were pretty excited. And it diffracted to less than one angstrom, both parts with really well, highly, highly ordered and great diffraction data. So just going back to just another caveat of my field is this is the equation for solving a protein uh, crystal structure. And to get the density on the left, um, you know, that's, that's the solution. So the experiment gives us everything in the middle, the green section. So all the diffraction data provides that part of the equation. And there's one other part, which is the bit at the very end, which is the phases. So if without both the phases and the intensity data, we can't solve the structure. And crystallographers have done this by either stealing a structure that looks really similar and stealing the phases from it, which we can approximate to then start improving the phases to pull out the structure, or we'd have to solve it by soaking in something like a heavy metal, getting anomalous signal, calculating where the heavy metals were, pulling out the phases for that to then drag out the structure of the protein. 
So that was how we used to do crystallography. So we weren't able to do that with this particular protein. So we got the data and we were really excited. We chose all the closest friends. We jammed it into the programs, nothing solved. We soaked the crystals, tried it with heavy metals, nothing worked. We're like, well, this is not helpful. So then we put the alpha fold model in and took phases from the alpha fold model. And immediately we got the structure. And so this told us that for structural biology, that it's useful not just for predicting the domains of the protein, but it also showed us we could solve unsolvable protein problems by stealing the phases from alpha fold. So there's a flurry of data in the PDB that looks experimental that has been phased from alpha fold models. So all sorts of proteins that are in the cupboard that we've had for years that we've worked on came straight out and the structures have been solved. So this here shows you how good alpha fold is from a real lab with real human beings, you know, non-published, that don't know what they're doing, kind of very much with AlphaFold. And you can see that very quickly we were able to produce um, useful data. And you can see the difference between the AlphaFold structure and the experimental structure. It's just in these tiny loop domains. So it's very, very accurate. Um, this unfortunately is not great if you needed to design a drug and it, you know the drug kind of binding location is where those loops are. But it's telling us that AlphaFold has brought us orders of magnitude closer to almost every problem that structural biology can solve. Um, with the caveat that you, there are cases where you're going to want more detail. So then more came, and this is really, really important. So they've published paper in October. It's still in preprint. I don't think it's going to go anywhere. I don't think they care. But this paper is really, really exciting. So they showed that you can look at coevolution not just within the fold of the protein, but you can look at coevolution across two proteins that interact. So you're just mining this residue A change in protein A with residue B in protein B. And if they co-change, you're mapping the interface of a complex. So for the first time, there's a completely new tool to mine protein-protein interaction in silico at the structural level. And this is really, really profound. So now we use AlphaFold almost exclusively in this mode to mine protein-protein interactions. So why is that important? Because proteins assemble into big machines that do jobs. So these are examples here. Hemoglobin, it's four subunits. They need to interact together. It doesn't work by itself. The ATP synthase, it makes all the energy in everyone's cells. It's made up of numerous protein components. One of the biggest problems in biology is mapping the interactions of how all these complexes assemble. So if now for the first time, we can do that in silico. So, and here's an example of one of my projects. I just chucked in three proteins that we think were probably diamonds, and it immediately assembled it into a really complicated complex. This is the overlay of five, the top five models, and you can see that at every single time it calculates that structure independently, it calculates the same structure, which gives you lots of confidence that the structure is correct. And it's super easy to run. How do you run it? You simply provide it the protein sequence that you wish to run and hit go. It's really almost that simple. The only thing it can't tell you is the stoichiometry of the protein. So if you have two proteins that bind together, you have to tell AlphaFold to look specifically at that, those two proteins. If you have one protein that needs to form a channel of six of itself, you need to give it the six for it to do that calculation for you. It can't search and find it. There are, so there's a couple of different types of AlphaFold. There's the monomer run. There's a sort of slightly tweaked one, which can give you some kind of alignment data for the monomer. And then there's the multimer version. The multimer version is by far and large the most important. And that's mostly because the EBI database has been updated with every single protein sequence on Uniprot. So you almost never, ever need to run a monomer protein. Now, everyone just wants to run uh, multimers. So it outputs a whole swathe of files. Most of them are the multiple sequence alignments. There's a whole lot of um, ranking data. There's a bunch of pickle files, which make things a little bit um, uneasy for biologists to access the confidence data is hidden in those. It outputs a bunch of models, and that's basically what the structural biologist or biologist or med medical um, practitioner will take and look at. It, um, it does show differences across the models. So there's an example of four models, and you can see there's one that's well-structured um, on the uh, left. So this is actually ranked from the best, second, third, and fourth ranked model. And in this particular case, it's interesting because the first protein is actually not the right structure. The correct structure is the second one. And that's something that I flag to people that it's not always the best model that AlphaFold calculates. It's just doing a calculation. And we need to use biology and to really tie together the real data to work out which the right model is. And so it doesn't always get everything right. It comes with confidence values, and these are really important. Um, so there's two types. There's PLDDT and there's the PAE data. Um, these are output almost by default. Um, uh, they're on the EBI website. Galaxy has output them. And it's quite simple to code that for your Docker output to code it as well. Um, the first one tells you how confident each individual residue is. So the first graph at the top is also uh, replicated in the color coding of AlphaFold. So AlphaFold now comes out as a 
blue, cyan, yellow, and orange. If it's blue and it means it's above experimental confidence, it's dark blue. If it's a little bit more hazy between 90 and 70% confidence, it's saying the backbone or the fold of the protein is correct, but the side chains might be wrong, and that's in cyan. And anything from yellow down to orange is a bit sketchy, and you should be very careful. And what we are seeing is there are really large unstructured sections of proteins that don't seem to have any apparent fold. Most of the time, these are explainable, but there's also a lot of really interesting cases as to why this is happening. And, um, it's explained why we can't crystallize a lot of proteins for a long time. Um, so it's a really good predictor of disorder. There's a whole field of protein study called intrinsic protein disorder. And that field is really frustrated because AlphaFold predicts their protein families better than their best programs did themselves. So that's been a bit of an eye opener. The second um, um, error uh, is the pre um, predicted aligned error. And it tells you the relationship of um, one part of the structure to another part of the structure. So it's basically aligning one residue compared to all the other residues in the models and says, does that residue land in the same three-dimensional space all the time? And if it is fixed, they're saying they're related to each other and it describes domains. It actually sort of ends up showing us um, um, dynamics of the protein. So I think this paper here shows quite clearly that um, the, you, can, you can see domains, full domains, and you can see flexible components of the protein by looking at the pairwise alignment data. It's probably not all that interesting to you guys, but it's very important for the structural biologists to interpret that data. Um, so just to sort of, I think you learn best by seeing. So here's an example of one protein and you can see that's a long string and there are little bits that are folded and then along the long string. And so the first chart's showing little globular domains um, with little um, flexible linkers between them. And then the second one shows a much more um, extended complex where there's lots of proteins that interact with each other. And you can see there's much more cross marks of green showing that this protein has a very fixed orientation to this protein as well. So these are giving you insights for strengths of protein, protein interactions and domain interactions. Here's a few more examples. There's two little proteins. You can see the confidence of them is quite high and you can see that, um, you know, they're both um, interacting. You can see that the cross green tells you that they're interacting. So how has it been used? Um, it's been used to look at clinical data. Now, AlphaFold can't mine a missense mutation and that's because when you think about how AlphaFold's folding a protein is it collects two residues that are conserved in co-evolutionary, co and it keeps doing that across the whole protein, and it wants to collect hundreds of those, not just one. If you put a point mutation in a protein, which can break the protein, you're just removing one of the little staples. And so it's very insensitive to seeing the removal of a single staple. So it'll still fold the protein because it needs to make the other 462 you know, pairwise alignments, and it's just missing one of them. And so when you put in a protein residue change, it doesn't really see that much of a change. Um, and so that's a big problem with it. But what it can do is provide us with structures for proteins we've never had any structural information for. And we can mine data now looking for, and I work with a clinician who has these terrible kids with really nasty muscular dystrophies. They sequence the kids, they find these weird proteins that have errors that we don't know what they do. We can now map those errors to the alpha fold structure and work out whether it's likely to be detrimental to the fold of the protein or the function of the protein. And we've actually got diagnoses and starting down the path of developing therapeutics. So, Already within a year and a half, we've got more insight and into treatment and understanding of um, disease than we've ever had before. It's totally changing lots of fields. The panel on the left was a predicted structure of a viral protein, of how we thought it looked. And the whole field has been working on this little individual domain of the protein for a long time. And this is a big virus, like one of the like hepatitis that people kind of really think they know. When you alpha fold it, you can see that that protein domain actually folds out across a much larger part of the protein. And so that little domain that the whole field's been focusing on is actually a completely in vitro fabrication. And that the protein itself is spread across the domain of a very much larger part of the protein. So the whole field's had a bum steer for a long time. And now they're going off in a completely different direction. And we wouldn't have known this unless we'd solved the structure of the whole thing or if we didn't have alpha fold. So there's the probing protein-protein interactions. Uh, we've had friends in the malaria field who pulled out some proteins saying, we think these interact. I kind of assumed it was going to be the front end of the protein. I alpha folded them. Alpha fold says they do not interact in any way, shape, or form. I then do it with the other end of the protein, and all of a sudden, alpha is really confident that these parts of the protein interact at the other end. So that fast tracks them in the lab. They know immediately where to start looking for the interaction now, so we can start looking at how this um, is affecting um, cells. Uh, we can use it to reconcile a whole bunch of biological data. So there's these uh, medics who've been working on a, a lung um, problem. They had these two proteins they'd known for a long time. They didn't know what they looked like. They knew there was important glycosylation sites. They didn't understand why. I alpha folded them together. And the two glycosylation sites are the little pink dots that are right at the dimerization interface that proves why the glycosylation was important for protein-protein interaction. 
And so immediately all sorts of biological data can now be reconciled that we could never understand before because we didn't understand the protein-protein interaction, we didn't understand the structure. And this all happened, you know, within a few hours. Like the next day they had the answer and their lab's gone off on a totally different direction. So what cases doesn't AlphaFold support? It doesn't support single um, chain predictions that, uh, it shows that they may be in different conformations. We don't have control over the actual output of AlphaFold. So it may change shape when it binds to a complex. It may calculate the, sh the shape of the complex bound form or the monomeric form. Um, we know with moving proteins like machinery that they've got to have lots of moving parts. We have no control over what AlphaFold puts out. It might put out five different moving models or it may put them all out in one confirmation and you don't know what that confirmation is. For intrinsically um, disordered structures, um, you know, we just know that it has low confidence, but we don't really understand whether that's relevant or it's an aberration. Um, but we do know that it's the best method we have to predict disordered proteins. So it's better than any other method we have. Um, this is the conversation I had before about it not being um, predicted to affect mutations. Um, there's a bunch of papers here showing you can put point mutations in and alpha fold solves the proteins perfectly well. And these are very well characterized medical examples. Um, it doesn't predict any non-protein parts. So this is a big caveat because people go, oh, you know, I want to like look at my protein bound to a drug. Well, it doesn't do drugs. It doesn't speak drugs. I want to look at my protein bound to RNA. It doesn't speak RNA. I want to bind my protein and I think it's a zinc finger. It doesn't bind zinc. So, so it doesn't tell you that information. The one thing that we have discovered is that it solves structures so accurately that it leaves the hole and the position of the residues that would coordinate a zinc atom in a zinc finger. It leaves the hole that perfectly fits a heme. It shows you exactly the binding face of the RNA. And so it's just by missing things uh, at the site. So you can show two protein-protein interactions that would have a protein uh, transform um, modification in the, of the interface. And if you mine that interface and cut through it, you can see there's a hole inside. It's very good at it. So there's, there's a whole bunch of papers showing it time and time again for a whole bunch of different examples. It's not good for performing docking for drugs. So this paper is quite interesting and sort of shows that um, you can find the pockets perfectly well. It calculates the pockets very well, but you, when you perform traditional docking methods, it is poorer than if you perform traditional docking methods on an experimentally true structure. So there is some sequence variation of side chains that's still affecting it. So this is still a working uh, problem. And then the last one was really important was engineering. So a whole bunch of engineers were like, great, we can now fold a whole bunch of synthetic sequences. We just make a synthetic sequence, see if it folds an alpha fold, we can make it, we're off, biotech's flying. And they've shown now that lots of really confident alpha fold structures are not able to be made in the lab. And there's an important point here is that alpha fold doesn't speak protein folding. It speaks stable protein fold at the end. So the folding process is going from that string to folding through this, difficult pathway to produce the final structure. And it's kind of like squeezing past the door to get into the room. The low energy state might be, might be quite hard to attain. And if you build a particular uh, synthetic sequence, it may not be able to reach the low energy stable structure because it has a high energy you know, impediment on the way of the folding path. And so that's a big problem that's being addressed at the moment in deep learning. So yeah, it totally doesn't understand folding. And that's a totally separate problem. So when people say AlphaFold has solved folding, they are wrong. AlphaFold has solved structure. The folding problem is a separate problem. It's a nuance that you need to understand. Okay, so advances on the back of AlphaFold too. There's a whole bunch of code that's just using AlphaFold as it is, but we're now using it to totally re-annotate primary sequences. So we can look at the structures of the AlphaFold and we can re um, correctly classify protein names in databases. So there's already a huge effort now in Uniprot to rename all their, you know, hypothetically named proteins to reassign them to their correct group that they belong to, which we'd got wrong. The EBA database now contains, you know, this 240, 14 um, million structures. You probably never need to run a monomer anymore. So that's a huge service. Originally it was very small. It's now very large. So we don't really need that mode very often. Although there is one thing I can say is that EBI just gives you a single protein um, structure. It doesn't give you um, all five models and there is information to be gleaned from the model, the different models that AlphaFold produces. So if you need to really look at a particular protein, you might need to run it yourself. There's a FoldSeq lookup and this one's super cool and I use it a lot. You AlphaFold a weird protein, you come up with a super weird structure and you're like, wow, that's cool. What the hell's that? You can feed that now into reverse lookup engine and it will search the entire AlphaFold database and say, hey, I've seen that fold before and it's here, here, here and here. And sometimes those proteins have assigned jobs or functions and you can use that to then call back to your organism and go, hey, I think this protein might be involved in this process. And it's very, very illuminating. 
You can now copy over existing cofactors from um, PDB files. So that problem I said where you had a zinc atom and you wanted to get an alcohol model, you can now just use this program and it just reads and copies over the, the, the ligands directly into your alpha-fold model. So it's very good for researchers to get a good working model of their own organism. Um, and now this is the exciting part, which I think you guys need to pay attention to, because this is the change and the field that's happening right now. So there's a lot of deep learning applications that are coming out on the back of this, um, and it's to answer all those limitations that AlphaFold have. I need to warn you that a whole bunch of these papers are in preprint, so we can't necessarily trust them, but they're coming out daily. I want you to look at the impact factor journals, the quality of the journals that are publishing this stuff. So it's moving really fast. It's considered high impact in the field it's affecting and look at the dates. Like this is really fast. I'm gonna move through this quickly. All of the references are in uh, a PDF that um, Garris can give you afterwards. Um, okay, so mutational analysis. Yep, we've got solutions to that. We're now gonna use it by graphical attention networks. Um, there's gonna be a bunch of these, so I'm just gonna move through them. Antibodies, yep, we can do that too. Um, antibodies are a particularly unique case because the base of the structure of the antibody is always the same, but the whole point of the antibody is the very top section is hypervariable because you need to be able to identify thousands of different foreign things. And so you can't mine that by evolution. But if we really deeply train our deep learning networks, we can now calculate structures without doing the multiple sequence alignment. So the co-evolution is not needed anymore. And that's a really significant difference, which I'll talk about in a minute. RNA structures. Yes, we've got a whole bunch of um, deep learning algorithms that are looking at mining the RNA database as well as mining the proteins. So we can start to map protein complexes. We've got the same just with RNA. So RNA is a big issue with um, medical uh, treatment. Now we can calculate it. And, and this particular paper is interesting because they only use 18 structures for RNA. So the R RNA field tells me you can't do this. It's never going to work for RNA because AlphaFold needed to train on 100,000 protein structures and we don't have that many for RNA. So it's never, ever going to work. Well, these guys trained on 18 RNA sequences and were able to produce you know, experimentally um, predictable structures. So it's coming for RNA as well. And so this is a really, really big change. And so it's all about how you train your network. And so training is becoming critical and the code is very GPU hungry. So this is the all problem is that there's going to be researchers that want to see this stuff or use this stuff and they're going to need resources to do it. So this one's really interesting. It used 23 million coding sequences. So what we're finding with these natural language models is you just need a hell of a lot of data. And the more data you have, the more fluent you, you speak the language. And in the language is the structure, which kind of makes sense because we've been taking proteins from one organism and expressing them in another for years and we've folded up. So the language of fold is inherently in the structure, in the amino acid sequence. You just need to be fluent enough in the language. Engineering, okay? So this one's really interesting. The goal now is to focus on this folding problem because we know it's a big problem. There's a whole bunch of different models now. So there's a diffusion model. Um, so a lot of work's been done by the Baker Lab, who are really big in, um, in the folding problem. They, that's what they do is they're engineers. So they've got a whole different bunch of structures, uh, machines that do this. So there's one on diffusion. There's another one um, on a message pa um, passaging neural network. So there's a whole lot of different architectures which are achieving the same sort of thing to build synthetic sequences. But I think the most exciting one I want to talk to you about is hallucination. So this particular um, method enables you to reach new sections of protein folds that are possible that have never been explored by evolution. So evolution is cheap, biology is cheap. It steals the same solution again and again and again and just perverts it, twists it, bends it to readapt it. It isn't very good at de novo building something brand new. And so there's whole sections we're discovering of foldable uh, protein space that's never been accessed by, by biology. And using hallucination, you can fold using deep understanding of the protein language, you can access folds that would be possible that biology has never experienced. And so using hallucination, they're able to do this. So they learn the language of folding and they keep um, selecting noise. The paper is quite an interesting one to read, so you should have a look at it. Um, and they kind of show that you can invert the existing language networks trying to solve the problem to fold um, a protein. So you can make a completely different um, you know, structure that's never been tested before. So you start with a, you keep optimizing using Monte Carlo. You guys will probably speak it better than I do. But the important part is there's whole sections that have never been um, accessed before. 
and that the structures that they're producing from these networks can be solved experimentally and proven to be correct and that we can access these structures that we've never seen before. So this is a very exciting time for biotech. Um, there's lots and lots of um, language models here showing that you can um, follow evolution. So just feeding in heaps and heaps of data shows us that evolution is entirely predictable. So you can follow whole family um, evolution across protein folding and you can understand uh, exactly what you would expect a protein to do. And now you can push that to an extreme to design a, a biotech uh, enzyme for the first time. So we can now engineer classes of uh, lysozyme, um, all sorts of enzymes. You can, you can choose the function that you want using the sort of deep understanding that these networks have kind of given us insight to. So ligands, modifications, docking, yep, there's plenty of those too. It's all coming out. You know, this is another nature paper. You know, this one shows you modifications. Yep, this one shows you lysine acetylation. This one shows you ubiquitination. This one shows you um, succinylation. So there is a deep learning piece of code for every single thing you can think of now. And this has all happened, you know, May 2022. It's moving really, really fast. Very scary. Computational efficiency. This is one of the biggest problems. It's computationally heavy. So we need to be able to make it faster and cheaper. So OpenFold is now a PyTorch implementation of our fold, completely retrained on exactly the same parameters, performs as well, but has a whole bunch of little tricks. They've rewritten um, a bunch of code. So there's this really nice paper from Google saying that self-retention doesn't need that much in memory. So this one is much less labor intensive than AlphaFold. They also wrote some CUDA kernels to improve um, the you know, calculation. So we're working on making this cheaper and faster. And why is that important? And that's because we need to start mining complexes and complexes are big and heavy and we need as much compute power free for mining complexes. So now we're also looking at accuracy with complexes. And um, we use very early on traditional approaches of just mixing lots of the different neural net results together and combining it with structural biology and um, biological data to show that we can get much better um, results. But now we, um, so this concept of ensembling, we know that it works much better, um, but there actually are now deeper, deeper learnings, which are telling us that we probably don't even need to worry so much about that coming. So um, this one's quite an interesting one, talks about the um, just understanding that we can predict uh, protein evolution. And I like this line that said, we found the genetic rules learned by large language models were su sufficient to predict the evolution of a specific protein. So you just need to feed in all the information we have and these new neural nets can work out where it's come from and where it's going to. So this is a very exciting um, outcome. And, and maybe it's a bit fuzzy as to why this becomes exciting, but this particular paper, which is from um, uh, Facebook, um, uh, um, showed that by providing 200 million sequences rather than the 100,000 that AlphaFold was trained in, that you can now um, produce this, this program called EM, um, ESM fold. And you can now predict the structure of a protein by providing the protein sequence alone, which you do with AlphaFold, but it doesn't do the first multiple sequence alignment step. It completely removes that, which is a third of the compute problem. And that's a really big improvement. You, it now speaks protein so well, it doesn't need to compare proteins with all the other proteins. It knows how to fold. So that's telling you that within the language of protein structure, the fold information is contained. So that's a really big change. It's quite a subtle change, but it really tells us quite a lot of stuff. So it's native to the language protein folding, which makes sense because there's nothing else telling a protein how to fold other than the sequence you provide it with. So then, um, there's this huge metagenomic atlas. They've got 772 million predicted structures that they folded this way. Uh, it's not as accurate as AlphaFold. Um, not sure what that means, but why this becomes important is that we're freeing up GPU now for complex. So you can use this method that's much better to now brute force meta metagenomes by, by complexes. So it's randomly folding protein A with protein B. Like that's an order of magnitude that's out of the park. Right? This is a big computational problem. So this was one that published last Thursday. So just look at this. This is a, just a typical case of what we're seeing. Okay, this one came from China. It came out last Thursday. It trained on a cluster for 13 days with 96 uh, A100 8 times 40 GPU servers and consumed a trillion tokens. It's not baby compute here. It's ginormous. And every piece of code that I showed you is trained in a similar way, maybe not as big as this one, but it's coming for you. 
the only saving grace you have as computing people is that the structural biologists haven't cottoned on yet. But when they do, they're going to be knocking on your door. So I suspect, suspect you set your price high. So I just wanted to say, um, there we go, this one's just telling you, this one's they say they can do all these things. They trained it to do all sorts of crazy stuff. You know, it can do all these things, solubility, prediction of secondary structure, fluorescence, fitness, localization. It can train by just speaking huge amounts of data, you can characterize a whole protein in silico. And even then they just go, oh, just for, you know, for giggles, we'll just also solve antibody structures as well because we speak protein so well. So, you know, this stuff is in pre, so much of this is in preprint. It's just, and the field's moving on. I don't even know if it's ever going to come out. Uh, so it, it's, it's big. So yeah, these are the references. I have them all. We've got a PDF. You can just have it. I don't care. Um, these are them. You've got them all. These are the real killer papers, I would say, that are changing the field. Pay attention to attention is all you need. This paper is probably the paper of the century. Like, I really think you should pay attention to it because it's what made chat GPT possible. It's what's made AlphaFold possible. It's what's making the big difference here in these deep learning networks. And then these other papers here on um, the deeper deep learning and the hallucination are really interesting concepts of how we can explore the deep learning space more fully. More references, I've got them all. Um, so you'll get them all if you want them. And then I just wanted to say um, thank you um, to, for having me. And I hope that we can have an interesting conversation um, and just thank my colleagues at, um, at work. <laughs> Hi, Kate. We have a question online from Prash, and they say, an excellent talk, Kate. Thank you. Their question is, how does AlphaFold work for intrinsically disordered proteins, and what are the current implications? Okay, so it just makes it intrinsically disordered. So it'll, it'll calculate a structure that's orange all the way. Um, and that's because the definition of the protein for the intrinsically unstructured protein field is they have a database of proteins that they say is intrinsically disordered by every method that we know about. And when AlphaFold was first released, before it was released publicly, I think that database was fed through AlphaFold. And AlphaFold pulled three structures out of their database that had a fold. And so the intrinsically distorted structure people went, ha, AlphaFold's no good, it's got it wrong. And then someone showed experimentally that those proteins that they thought were unstructured were structured. Um, and I don't know why it's better at it than any other um, method, but it just will show you an unfolded string that kind of you know spray of amino acids that look like it's a beautiful ballerina turn is not really what's going on it's just telling you that i don't know what to do with these residues so i'm just putting them out of the way of the model so it's probably doing this and why some proteins obtain their structure when they bind to their partners so you know we need to form a machine i will adopt my structure to grab hold of it you know we've got bendable fingers it's think of it that way um so if the protein needs to uh, change its shape dramatically to interact, then it's not surprising they may be unstructured. But then what the other ones are doing, I, I don't know. And whether they're all working that way is a different question. I don't, it's a, that's a big problem in biology. And I guess that's one of the things that AlphaFold's opened up, is just the sheer number of disordered sections. Lots of them you see on the EBI database because the front half of the protein has signaling sequences um, and flexible domains, which are normally processed away. So the, alpha fold, the EBI database is the raw unprocessed protein. And so a lot of them, we already know that the front half of the protein gets trimmed off. And so that makes sense why it's unstructured or it's floppy and we, we don't care about it. So most of the structural biologists already know that and just ignore it. Um, so we know in those cases what that's about. But yeah, I don't speak an intrinsically unstructured protein because I work on protein machineries that we know fold. So I think that's a question probably better directed for the intrinsic field, but it gets it right. And when it says it's unstructured, that's what we see. Does that answer it? Thumbs up. Hey, thank you very much. That was a really, really interesting talk. Um, I want to ask you, is there, you did mention the multimer, the one that, that it can predict, but can it, does it only do it on sort of uh, mares of the same protein or can it predict two proteins that interact from each other if I give it the whole proteome of, can, can it find sort of which proteins can interact with each other? Yep, and that's how we use it. So you can't, it's constrained by compute. 
So the bigger you get, the harder it is and the more computationally expensive it gets. And I'm sure Gareth will tell you about the bill he's footing for people who are alpha folding big stuff, how annoying that is. But um, we can mine protein-protein interactions this way. So someone comes to me and goes, I'm pretty certain that protein A interacts with protein B. Can you alpha fold them together? And yep, that's exactly what we do. And we see that, oh, look, the front half of the protein doesn't, but the back half of the protein does. And so immediately you can start to see uh, the formation of complexes. And in the tutorial I did yesterday, I showed you can assemble a massive complex of five proteins. And I kind of restricted the folds from the databases so that all the previous solved structures were removed because someone solved the structure of the complete complex uh, this year. So I removed that from the alpha fold runs and we reassembled the entire complex from a different organism completely de novo, and then compared it with the structure that was solved experimentally and published by cryo -EM this year in Nature and showed it was the same. So yes, you can. And so at the moment, it's about trying to create as much free GPU compute time so that you can mine as many of these as possible because these interactions in the lab are really hard to do experimentally. Like you have to make each protein or you have to engineer the organism with all sorts of tweak, tricky little tricks, you know, tags, labels, you know, it's hard to image them. It's hard to understand what's going on. This is infinitely faster. And I would never work on a protein again or a protein complex again without alpha folding it. And I absolutely mean that. Absolutely. It's shocking. It's coming for us. I have a question about um, when will the last poor student do the last yeast two hybrid? I reckon they're almost done, man. I <laughs> Have we done the last one of those? Is that now officially obsolete? I don't think I would run one again, to be honest. <laughs> I mean, I, I think it's, yeah, I think we're approaching that. I, I think it's, um, the advantage is that um, yeast 2 hybrid, so it's a method, I don't know if, if, if you know, you can basically, you know, clone two bits of proteins and test in vivo if they interact in the yeast by bringing two markers together. Um, it's quite cumbersome, doesn't work for lots of reasons. There's lots of false negatives, lots of false positives. Um, it works for two proteins. I just folded five in alpha fold the other day for the tutorial and it took eight hours. I spent, I spent four years of my PhD trying to do one component of that complex and failed. It's been 20 years since then before they solved the complex and we did it on Galaxy in eight hours and 45 minutes last how, Sunday night. How about um, generally floppy proteins like leucine rich repeats or transmembrane proteins yeah so transmembranes work um sometimes we see that you get full transmembrane domain folding um i folded a really cool one from um, the malaria field of a protein that they had a drug for they didn't have any idea what it does they were not protein people they didn't know what to do with it it's only 100 amino acids how could that possibly be a drug target how could that possibly be interesting the first thing I did was look at the sequence. Hmm, okay, transmembrane, two transmembrane domain. Hmm, okay, it's very, very small. Hmm, looks like a, a channel. Let's multi, multi, like fold it as a multimer. It forms a perfect channel. The channel is lined perfectly with charge. It's got a hydrophobic gate. All of a sudden, it, it fully explained all the biological data of drugs, of the drug that they had as to why it functions and how it functions. So now we just need to like prove you know, in vitro, that in vivo, that it, it forms this particular pore. So it gives you insight to things that we never had. Um, for really large things that are transmembrane, we often just chop half the protein off at the transmembrane location because the other half of the protein will never be involved in the interaction in the other compartment. So there are tricks trying to trim down the compute by running your multimers by using the smallest part of the protein you can. That kind of makes sense. So if you've got one half protein in one compartment, just look for protein protein interactions that way. Yeah, um, so yeah, you can, and it does sometimes show you the whole structure of the membrane section. Uh, yeah, I mean, again, really, really cool. Um, I have one question. Um, do you think it might be problematic for future modeling and prediction efforts uh, to have mixed experimental data augmented with predicted data? Like you mentioned the, that you can take the phase from a, a different protein to, to do the structure and the structure I don't know if, if, if that's like recorded in the metadata or something that one is aware and like that for future yeah. modeling yeah. efforts, you're not just yeah. reproducing so the, the biases. Yeah. So the crystallography fields dealt with this problem for a long time. And so we have very explicit databases. They have very high standards. You've got to show exactly how you solve things. Um, but I'll tell you when we do like um, molecular replacement with phasing, what you would typically do is you have your protein friend from organism X. 
and you want to phase it so you choose organism-wise protein. You take organism-wise protein and you remove all the side chains. You just keep the backbone of the protein and you take off all the side chains. So you just, what we call al alanine the protein, so it's just alanines. And we use that for phasing. And then when you've solved it correctly, when you walk down the density of your protein, the phenylalanines pop up and the histidines pop up in exactly the right locations. So you know for sure that you've got the right thing. So I'm not concerned by this um, with AlphaFold, that using AlphaFold in this particular way, mixing experimental data. In fact, I would encourage you to mix experimental data. I do have some concerns about the deeper, deeper learning methods that are stealing AlphaFold models to improve the training of the deeper networks. So if AlphaFold is making mistakes and we're training those deeper networks on erroneous structures, that could be more problematic. And so that's my bigger concern. But at the moment, it works really, really well. And you saw the first example we had, like we did it experimental. We, we didn't believe it. We were disbelievers. We were structural biologists. We're like, no, crystallography rules. And we were shown very quickly and very rudely that, you know, AlphaFold's got this. Um, and so I would always argue that any part of science, 30% of it's wrong. We don't know which bit. Mix your data, all types, from every source to try to build the best model you can. And whether it's AlphaFold, whether it's EM, or whether it's a cell biology experiment, or whether it's some you know sick kid in hospital, use all the data you can to build the best model because that's how we get to get the best models. Right? I mean, we love Newtonian physics until Einstein came along, and then his model was better, right? So um, I don't think this is any different. But it, it gives us insight, like deeper insight than what our little brains can handle. And the millions and millions of sequence and millions of years of evolution can tell us a lot. And that's what is so exciting about these deep learning kind of networks. Uh, thanks for a really interesting talk. Um, I'm, I'm a computer scientist, software engineer, so I'm going to ask something from that perspective rather than the other side. But Remember, I'm not trained in that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so is, is AlphaFold essentially a solved problem or are they continuing to refine you know, that, that aspect of it? Is there going to be an AlphaFold 3, for example? You know, what's happening with, the, with Google's that? Google's been tight-lipped about what they're doing. They've definitely formed a company called Isomorphic Lab to go off and use this sort of deep tech to move into drug discovery and docking, which makes sense. Um, I believe that the DeepMind team's still doing something, although they're fairly quiet. But you can see the activity in the space that people have taken the ideas from AlphaFold and have retrained their own. OpenFold, we're trying to make it cheaper. There's definitely code tweaks. And you can also see that AlphaFold gets it wrong. And so by training on larger data sets, we've actually understood that we can get better um, understanding of the protein language. And so I suspect there's going to be more improvements. At the moment, AlphaFold does such a good job for the one task it was originally designed for and for more that you know we're not seeing a huge reason for people to leave the platform. And I still would recommend that's the best one to use. I'm very keen to try OpenFold because they say it, it performs as well as our fault, and nothing else performs as well. Like all the deeper, deep learning ones predict for a lot less of the compute, and they've been able to brute force in millions more structures, but they're considered less accurate than AlphaFold. And I'm a bit of a, you know, I only deal with a small number of things. I'd much prefer to work with the best model I can get my hands on. And if I can do a better compute, I'd prefer to do that and wait to get the best answer I can before I move on, because there's so much more downstream that hinges on the correctness of those structures that I don't want to take the risk. But I think that there's definitely space in this area to, to add. And I strongly believe that the biological data mixed together is going to help more, so. OK, I know that there are lots, lots more questions for Kate online I'm available. and in the room. Time. But unfortunately, we are going to have to leave it there for this ses session. So once again, thank you, Kate, for that sharing your experiences in AlphaCode. <laughs>